Okay, so this is joint work with Michael Meyer and Michael Narig. Now, I have a habit of um, really talking over time when I do these pre-recorded talks, so I'm going to try to talk relatively quickly, um, but you can slow down the, the playback speed if it's going too fast. So in this work, we're very interested in looking for numbers like the two highlighted in the middle of the screen. Like most good problems in uh, mathematics or computational number theory, it's, it's again one of those problems that's quite easy to state and easy to understand what the problem is, but it turns out it's uh, not as easy as you would hope to solve the problem. So the reason we're looking for two numbers like the, the two in the middle of the screen is that when we write the prime factorization, both of these numbers are very smooth. Certainly with, with, uh, in reference to their neighbours, relative to the numbers that, that are close by, the largest prime factor occurring in these two consecutive integers is 47. So the problem we're trying to solve is to find two consecutive integers whose product is very, very smooth with respect to some fixed smoothness bound. So you can see that the surrounding numbers have uh, prime, their largest prime factors are a lot bigger than 47, but these two are very, very smooth uh, relative to, to the numbers that they're surrounded by. So the rest of the talk is going to go like this. So I'm first of all going to motivate why we're interested in the problem. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some first attempts at trying to find twin smooths before we move to the, the point of this work and, and the improvements that we found in this paper, which is the PTE sieve. Okay, so why are we interested in this problem? Well, some very recent constructions of isogeny-based uh, public key protocols are both reliant on finding uh, two consecutive smooth integers. In fact, they're reliant on a special case of the problem where not only do we find two consecutive smooth integers, but we find these integers where their sum is a prime. Okay, so what these schemes rely on is finding a prime of the form 2m plus 1, a large prime 2m plus 1, such that m and m plus 1 are both smooth. Uh, and therefore, P plus or minus 1, which is 2M and 2M plus 2, are also both smooth. So what we're looking for, to, to state the problem concisely, is we're looking for two twin smooth numbers whose sum is a prime. And if we find such an instance, then we can, we can instantiate uh, B side and Ski sign and perhaps some uh, other variants of these protocols to be more efficient than if we were to instantiate them over a prime whose, whose neighbours are not so smooth. So really the efficiency of these schemes is very, very dependent on the uh, largest prime factor appearing in P plus one or P minus one. Now to just unpack that for a moment, uh, recall that in SIDH and Psyche, Alice and Bob set this prime P to be a power of two times a power of three minus one. And that's because Alice computes two to the A isogenies and Bob computes three to the B isogenies. And for those isogeny computations to be, um, to be efficient uh, within the protocol, we want those two factors, the two to the A and the three to the B, to, three to the power of B to divide P plus one. But it turns out that Alice and Bob don't both need to squeeze their, their isogeny degrees into P plus one. It turns out that they can actually um, split so that Alice Alice uses prime factors of P plus one and Bob uses prime factors of P minus one. So if we take P plus one to be two times M and P minus one to be two times N, then quite trivially, the, the GCD of M and N must be one. The only common factor of P plus one and P minus one can be two. Um, so Alice is gonna compute M isogenies and Bob is gonna compute N isogenies. And what we're looking for is for M and N to be as smooth as possible. So ideally, what we would have is that M was two to the A just like before and N was three to the B uh, just like before. But unfortunately, the largest such prime where M and N can both be of this form is 17. So the largest pair of twins that are three smooth, the largest pair of consecutive integers that are three smooth are eight and nine. There's no larger consecutive integers that are uh, whose largest prime factor is, is less than three. Uh, and it turns out that their sum is the prime 17. So that's our best uh, prime that sits between two, three smooth numbers. So 
So given that 17 is the, the largest such number that's sandwiched between a, a power of 2 and a power of 3, or 2 times a power of 2 and 2 times a power of 3, what we want to do is to be able to bump up the size of that prime to be cryptographically sized, so say bigger than 200 bits, uh, such that it's sandwiched between two numbers whose prime factorization, it's not going to be prime powers for reasons that I won't get into, but whose factorization contains only primes that are that are up to some bound. So in this next stage, I'm going to define what twin smooths are and look at the first attempts that were that were uh, made at trying to, to find large cryptographically sized ones. So let's just recall what uh, the definition of smoothness is. So an integer is said to be B smooth if it has no prime factors larger than B. So typically we fix some smoothness bound big B and we look for integers whose uh, prime factors are no, no bigger than B. Now, two consecutive integers, m and m plus 1, are called B-smooth twins if their product is B-smooth. So if each of them is B-smooth, their product will be B-smooth and vice versa. Uh, so that's what we're looking for. We're looking for numbers m and m plus 1 that are both B-smooth. Now, I'll ignore the, the um, criteria of their, pro, uh, their sum being a prime for most of the talk, but it should be said that this is a lot more rare for the types of numbers we'll be looking for. Um, finding these consecutive smooths is a lot more difficult than uh, hoping that, pro that their sum is a prime. So we're looking for ways that we can find enough, enough of these uh, twin smooth pairs at a given size because once we find enough of them, then um, heuristically we're guaranteed that, or, or, or we should be, uh, we should have a very good probability that their sum will be a prime. Um, certainly, if they can, they both contain many small factors that are, um, and they're co-prime to each other, then that rules out uh, their sum having either of those factors. Um, and so, actually, their, their sum being a prime is a, is a little more likely than a than a random a random number of the same size. Okay, so for concreteness, our goal is to find this prime that is sandwiched between two smooth integers. Uh, or equivalently, as I said, we're looking for these two consecutive integers, m and m plus 1, that are both smooth. And if we find enough of them, we'll be able to find such a pair whose sum is a, is a prime. But for the, for, for the remainder of the talk, just think that we're trying to find two consecutive smooth integers of a, of a large cryptographic size. Now, if we fix a smoothness bound and look for, uh, look for the largest uh, consecutive smooth integers with respect to that smoothness bound, that is a problem that has a deterministic solution. It's just that finding all such pairs and therefore finding the largest such pair, is it takes exponential time. So to give some examples, the largest three smooth twins, the largest consecutive integers that are, whose product is three smooth is eight and nine. It just so happens that their sum is also prime, as we saw before. The largest five consecutive smooth twins are 80 and 81. It just so happens that their sum is also a prime. In general, the largest uh, consecutive M smooth, uh, the, the B smooth twins um, won't have a prime sum. But if, again, if we find all of them, then one of the largest ones will, will have, a, have a prime sum. Uh, and so here we've also listed the largest 113 smooth twins. They have M being around uh, 74 bits, okay? And then the largest 113 smooth twins whose sum is a prime is less than that, uh, less than that example. It's around 66 bits. And as I said, uh, and, and I won't get into the details here, but to find the largest B smooth twins, in fact, to find all of the pairs of B smooth twins, um, you have to solve two to the power of pi B Pell equations, where pi B is the number of primes up to B. So I think 113, there's, uh, including 113, there's uh, 30, 30 primes up to 113. So finding that uh, largest 113 smooth twins required the solution of two to the 30 Pell equations. That's not really an easy task. So going much higher uh, using this exhaustive method is is becomes computationally infeasible quite quickly. And it turns out that we can't. Um, th these m's are not big enough to be cryptographically secure. Remember, we want these m's to be at least 200 bits in size. So exhausting all of the B smooth twins for a given smoothness bound B turns out to be infeasible for our purposes.
Now, something that's kind of important to understand this work is uh, smoothness probability. So when we're looking at numbers of a certain size, we want to know what the probability of them being B smooth with respect to a fixed smoothness bound is. And the way that this, uh, these heuristics and this theory is presented is by presenting the smoothness bound as the youth root of the number you're looking at. So the probability that an integer m is b smooth, where b is m to the power of 1 over u, is given by this row function, this Dickman row function. And all of these heuristics rely on m approaching infinity, but for our purposes, our numbers are close enough to infinity that these heuristics are quite good. So suppose we take a random m of 256 bits, the probability that it is 2 to the 128 smooth, so the probability that it has no prime factors bigger than 2 to the 128, is roughly 3 tenths, so it's row of 2. The probability that m is 2 to the 64 smooth, so it contains no prime factors that are more than a quarter of its bit length, is roughly uh, 1 in 200. And you get the point that the probability that the largest prime factor isn't uh, isn't bigger than one eighth of its bit length becomes very very small 3.2 by 10 to the negative 8 and so on so we've got this we've got this concrete way to write down the probability that part of a number that that, that, a, that a given number a number of a given size is smooth with respect to a, a smoothness bound so long as we write that smoothness bound uh, as as one over u um, now obviously if u is one the probability is one because the probability that m is m smooth is is one, but uh, as long as the bigger u gets or, or the smaller that we want the prime factors, this probability degrades uh, exponentially. Now this row function gives us a really uh, easy way to analyze methods that we methods that we use to try to construct or to try to find these these twin smooth numbers. So on this slide, I'm going to talk about the three prior methods prior to this work um, that we use to, to, to try to look for, for twin smooths. Um, and just for the sake of concreteness, we're going to assume that we're looking for 256-bit uh, numbers. So M and M plus 1 are close to 2 to the 256. Um, and let's suppose our smoothness bound B is 2 to the 16. So the, the easiest way to, to look for these numbers now, for the, as far as the whole slide goes, if you see a green number, uh, that's a number that um, that we can construct to be smooth, okay? And then the red number is something that we hope to be smooth. So in the first example, we're looking for we, we can easily construct uh, m's that are smooth. So we can just take any any product of numbers that are less than b, uh, such that the product is is two to the, uh, around two to the two fifty six. And then what we're hoping is that either m or m plus uh, m minus one or m plus one is is smooth. So the probability that a 256-bit number is um, is uh, two to the 16 smooth, that would be the row function of 16, which is uh, two to the minus 70. So our chances of finding of constructing an M that's smooth and then it's one of its neighbors miraculously being smooth is close to two to the minus 70. So it, it really means that we'd have to try two to the 70 uh, such such smooth numbers M until we can expect to find uh, a smooth uh, a smooth pair, a, a pair of twin smooths. A, a slightly better approach that gives us a better probability is the extended GCD approach. So what we do there is we choose two numbers A and B that are both around half the bit length of, of M uh, and we use the extended Euclidean algorithm to find co-prime numbers S and T such that A times S plus B times T is one. And then as long as we arrange the signs properly, then we get um, the absolute value of A times S and the absolute B value of B times T differ by one. And then what we're hoping is that both S and T were smooth. Now, the chances of two numbers that are 128 bits being two to the 16 smooth is a lot better. Um, it's two to the minus fifty, but it still means we'd have to search over a lot of um, a lot of AB pairs until we find an S and T uh, that turn out to be two to the sixteen smooth. So again, the the intuition here is that the smaller we chop up these numbers, um, rather than looking for one two hundred fifty six bit 
a one two hundred fifty six bit number that's that's smooth. It's it's a lot better to look for two to the one two one hundred twenty eight bit numbers um, that are smooth. And the intuition there is uh, it kind of rules out any factors that are bigger than two to the one twenty eight that could have appeared in the first method. Um, so to to now look at the third method is this power method where we set m to be some power of x, some small nth power, in this case, n equals six. And then m minus one is x to the six minus one. And we're guaranteed that m minus one factors as x plus one times x minus one times these two quadratic terms. So these setting the, first, the, the larger number to be a power of, a power of x, and then uh, looking at the looking at the, the the smaller number as the power of x minus one, you're guaranteed that these two things factorise as, as shown, and then the the hope is that these smaller pieces um, these smaller pieces uh, are smooth, and that the probability of each of the smaller pieces being smooth is again in this case a lot better than uh, the probability that a, a random number of the the large size is is smooth. Now, prior to this paper, the best examples in the literature uh, were found using this third method. Um, so here's a couple of examples with uh, m plus one being x to the power of six and m minus one being the product of those two linear terms and the two quadratic terms. So in the first example, uh, Alice actually has the, the factorization of p plus one or m plus one uh, is two to the six smooth, or in this case, it's 53 smooth. So her x is this, this value that's raised to the power of six. And then over on Bob's side, his, uh, his, val his factorization, the, the, the largest prime factor there is um, less than two to the 20. So that occurs as one of the prime factors of the, the first quadratic term, x squared minus x plus one. Um, and then in a more balanced example, or slightly more balanced example, the second example, Alice chose an x that was two to the 12 smooth, and over on Bob's side, he got a he got a factorization of, of x to the six minus one that was two to the 19 smooth. So roughly speaking, I think two, b being close to two to the 19 was the best, um, in terms of numbers that were close to 256 bits, was the best kind of smoothness bound that um, the, that the twin, the twin smooth satisfied prior to, the, prior to this work. Okay, so what do we do in this paper that improves upon that, that third method? Well, if you look closely at the, at the row function as applied to that third method, the problem with it is these high degree terms, these two quadratic terms. So if we, we were searching over x's to, to, to find x to the 6 and x to the 6 minus 1 being uh, roughly 256 bits, we're searching for x's that are around 2 to the 42. And in that case, the probability of x itself or x minus one or x plus one being b smooth is far greater than the probability of the quadratic terms being b smooth. So for example, with b is two to the 14, the probability that a 42 bit number is two to the 14 smooth, that's the row function of three, which is roughly one in 20 or, or 0.04486. But the probability of a of the quadratic term being smooth is the row of six, which is 10 to the negative five or two times 10 to the negative five. Um, so the idea that we're, that we're trying to look at in this work is, can we find uh, M and M plus one that are both uh, polynomial functions, rational, rational polynomial functions, where F of X and G of X split completely into linear terms. So if we're talking about degree in the degree two case, that's rather easy. We can take f of x to be x squared and g of x to be x squared minus one. And we've got a factorization of, of both f of x and g of x into linear terms. But what we really want is to find, uh, to find f of x and g of x with, with degrees uh, a fair bit larger than two, uh, so that the, the probability of these, these factors um, being uh, being smooth with respect to a fixed smoothness bound becomes much greater. So what we're looking for here is we're looking for split polynomials in uh, in the polynomial ring uh, with, whose coefficients are rational with constant differences. 
So rather than differing by one, we can we can relax the requirement that the polynomials differ by one and, and actually tolerate constant differences. Um, so in this example, this, these two degree four f of x and g of x functions, um, they, they differ by 180, so they differ by a constant. But then what we can do is we can search over x such that f of x and g of x are both zero mod 180, therefore dividing f of x and g of x at a particular value of x um, by 180, you'll get two integers that differ by one. Okay, so to, to, to kind of give a high level over, overview of what we're doing here, we're not searching for large numbers m, such that m plus one is smooth, but rather we're gonna search for a lot smaller values of x, such that a bunch of these linear terms that are, that are much smaller, because x is much smaller, are all smooth. So the, the, the probability that in this case, uh, one 256 bit number is, is B smooth, will be a lot less than the probability of say seven or eight 64-bit uh, uh, numbers being, being B smooth. Now it turns out that the main difficulty in applying this approach to find, to find twin smooth integers is in finding these polynomials f of x and g of x that differ by a constant and that, that completely split over the rationals. Now, after trying to construct them ourselves for a while and running into problems beyond degree, uh, degree three and four, uh, we dug around the literature and it turns out that this problem is, um, is connected to what's called the prahe tariascott problem. Now this problem, um, the, the ideal formulation of this problem is to find two disjoint multisets, uh, a set of integers a1 through an and b1 through bn, such that their, uh, their sum is the same, the sum of their squares is the same, and the sum of their, all of their powers up to the nth minus one powers is also the same. So these two sets can't contain the same integer, uh, but they, they need to have the same sum and the same sum of squares and the same sum of cubes and so on up to the nth minus one uh, powers all summed together. So that example, the example of the two polynomials on the previous slide actually comes from uh, the solution to the, the PTE problem where the, the first set is 0, 4, 7, and 11, and the second set is 1, 2, 9, 10. And that's because the, the, the sum of the numbers in these two sets is the same, the sum of their squares is the same, and the sum of their cubes is the same. And it turns out that that's as, as much as you could hope for, um, is the n, n minus one powers of all these uh, these integers to be the same. And it's rather straightforward to see the connection between the solutions to the PTE problem and how they turn into the, into the two polynomials that we're looking for. In fact, all we do is take uh, a linear function of whose, whose roots are all of the, uh, solution in the solutions in the first set and a linear function whose roots are all the solutions in the second set. And it turns out that these will always have a difference, um, a constant difference when uh, viewed as polynomials over the rationals. Now it turns out that finding solutions to the PTE problem is, is rather non-trivial, but fortunately for our purposes, uh, a lot of this hard work had been done for us already. Um, so there's a, there's a fair few methods out there that not only find, um, not only find solutions, but also allow uh, infinitely many solutions to be generated from uh, a given solution to the to the PTE problem. So in particular, when we were looking for integers of around 256 bits in size, it turns out that the solutions with n equals 6 were somewhat of a sweet spot. Now, that's not only because um, the number of solutions uh, was plentiful, it's also because the power n being six um, is rather convenient. So we don't want n to be too large because if n's too large, it really shrinks the search space of uh, x's. So in this case, if n was 12, then we only get roughly two to the 22 values of x that we can search over for smoothness. But if n is too small, then the probability of the, the linear terms be, being smooth with respect to a fixed bound becomes a lot smaller. So in this case, n equals six was right on the money um, because then what we're looking for is, is 12 uh, 
12 functions of uh, linear functions of x um, that are smooth with respect to a given bound. Um, and n equals 6 means that we're searching over x's being uh, roughly 2 to the 43 in size. So we've got enough x's there to, to be able to sieve and look for, for smooth, uh, for those 12 uh, linear terms to be smooth. Just got really dark all of a sudden. Anyway, I'm going to go over this uh, next bit pretty quick because it's all kind of standard stuff from the literature. But uh, the first phase of our sieving algorithm um, needs to identify all of the smooth numbers in a given interval. So I'm going to give an example here using the smoothness bound b equals 7. We're going to sieve the 50 numbers from 4350 to 4399. So the first thing we do is in every place we, we put a 1. We start with a 1. And then we start with all of the primes up to b starting with 2. And we look at all the multiples of 2 and we multiply the, the, running, uh, the running product underneath each number by 2. Then we do the multiples of 4, multiples of 2 cubed, which is 8, multiples of 2 to the 4. And we keep doing multiples of 2 until there's no multiple in the interval, the last one being 2 to the 6, 64, or 2 to the 7, 128 rather, 56 I should say. And then there's no multiples of 2 to the 9 in that interval, so we're done with 2. We do the same thing for 3. 3 squared, 3 cubed, 3 to the 4, 3 to the 5, 3 to the 6, 3 to the 7. Multiples of 5. We keep going, multiplying the, the products underneath each number by the given multiple. And... So we're done. Same thing with the multiples of 7, 7 cubed. And then once we've processed all of the primes up to b, we look at all the numbers in that interval. And if any number underneath its index is the same as the number, we know that that number is 7 smooth. So in this case, there's only two numbers in the interval that are 7 smooth, and they happen to be twin smooths, 4374 and 4375. So that we, when we write out their factorization, of course, we're guaranteed that uh, there's no primes bigger than, than 7. So all that we need to do then is to have one bit of information in each index that corresponds to whether that index was smooth or not, whether that number was smooth or not. Um, so we've put two ones in the smooth numbers and the rest of them were non-smooth with respect to 7. So we've sieved the whole interval and we've marked uh, the smooth numbers with ones and left the, the non-smooth numbers as zeros. Now I gave the naive version of the, the sieving, but uh, this book, uh, the Prime Numbers book by Crandall and Pomerantz, gives a lot more optimizations that are, are much better in practice. So we can replace um, the numbers themselves with their logarithms, and that means we can uh, start with zeros all along, and then we can replace all of the, multi uh, the multipliers with additions. We can use approximations and we can skip the small primes and do all sorts of uh, probabilistic versions of the sieving that are much faster in practice. Okay, so now we come to phase two of the, the PT sieve. So what I just described is phase one, that's the standard stuff. The, the second phase is how we use the PT solutions uh, to, once we've sieved the interval, we, we then check for ones that align with our PTE solutions. So now let's illustrate with a much bigger example, a kind of real, real sized example, um, with b equals 2 to the power of 15 and the 50 numbers in this interval here. So suppose we've done step 1 with all the primes from 2, 3, 5, 7, all the way to 32, 749, all the primes up to 2 to the 15. We've sieved the interval exactly as I described before. And at the end of the day, we've identified the smooth numbers in that interval uh, and, and marked those indexes with one and the other indexes indices are marked with, with zero. Now the output of that step, is just a bit string of length 50 in that case, but of length the size of the interval. So once we've done phase one, we've processed the whole interval, we've got zeros for the non-smooth numbers and one for the smooth numbers. All we've got is a bit string whose, le uh, a bit string whose length is the length of the interval. And then we move on to phase two, which is to check that bit string against our PTE solutions. So in this case, our PTE solution 
was uh, 0351116 in the first set, and the second set we've got some repetition there 11881515. So what that means is if we move across this bit string with a uh, a, a window of length uh, 17 from the, uh, the solutions from 0 through to 16, um, then we we shift this moving one at a time um, until all of those indices align with uh, ones that represent smooth numbers in the interval. And in fact, we don't have to shift by one each time. We can just move the arrow above the zero to the very next one in the in the bit string. So we can keep processing like that. We start here. We see that not all of the arrows are pointing to ones. We move to the next one. We move the zero to the next one. Not all of the arrows there are pointing to ones. We keep doing that until array we've got all of the arrows pointing to ones and that means that with this particular PTE solution we've found two numbers we found a, a, sorry in this case nine numbers that are all smooth but when we combine them according to those two polynomials that correspond to our PTE solution we're guaranteed that we've got two uh, integers that differ by one that are both be smooth. And so here they are. We, that corresponds to this value of um, this value of u here. Um, and in this case, we also have that the sum of the two twin smooths was a prime. So we've got Alice with p plus 1 is 2 to the 15 smooth and Bob with p minus 1 also being 2 to the 15 smooth. So this is kind of the high level summary of the results, at least as far as we'd be concerned with in practice. Uh, we found a prime that was close to 256 bits, such that P plus or minus one were both two to the 15 smooth, just like the one we just saw. We found one that was 384 bits, where that was sandwiched between two numbers that are two to the 19 smooth. And we found a 512 bit prime or, or a prime close to 512 bits where the uh, P plus one and P minus one were both two to the 28 smooth. There's of course a lot more in the paper and I encourage you to take a look at it. Uh, but to finish up the future work, we're looking for, for better methods of finding twin smooths. And of course, at any of those levels or at, uh, at intermediate levels, we're, we'd always be interested in uh, any instances of smoother twins, no matter how they're found.